Daniel chapter 11. And uh, we'll start reading at verse 1. And uh, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but uh, we'll read a fair amount and maybe skip down to the end at one point. But Daniel 11, verse 1. Remember, Daniel has just seen, is an, has an angel talking to him. The angel says, I came to see you when you first started praying. And then the devil sent his own angel to resist God's angel. And uh, it was 21 days later that the angel finally got to Daniel. And uh, he's now revealing to him the vision in Daniel chapter 11. They're giving him the, the prophecy, the scripture of truth. So it says there, and also I in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. That's Alexander the Great. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. And the king of the south shall be strong. And one of his princes, he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of the arm. Neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up and they that brought her and he that begat her and he that strengthened her in these times. But out of a branch of her root shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north and shall deal against them, and shall prevail, and shall also carry captives unto Egypt, their gods, with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom, and shall return into his own land, but his son shall be stirred up, and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come, and overflow, and pass through, then shall he return, and be stirred up even to his fortress." And this is just keep going back and forth. And the king of the south shall be moved with collar and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. And this is just a battle between the kings of the north and the kings of the south that just keeps going on and on and on. And um, we're going to go down to verse number, <clears throat> down to verse number 35 is where I'd like to go down to for the rest of our reading, just to get us to the end of the chapter. But we're going to look at all these verses in between. I don't know how we're going to fit it all in this morning, but we're going to do our best. It says, and some of the... Uh, understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a year appointed and this is now beginning to talk about the antichrist it says and the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of woman, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with the strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. And at that at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. 
He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of the palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that should be found written in the book. Let's ask the Lord to bless this word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this passage of Scripture that we're considering this morning. Lord, it's such a wonderful passage of Scripture, and we think of how so accurately you prophesied of the years of the Grecian Empire, right down to Antiochus Epiphanes, and then you've given us a a prophecy for the future of the coming Antichrist and then the coming of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that we're not in the dark about what your plan is, about what's going to happen in this world. And I pray, Lord, that our faith this morning will be strengthened, that we'll get our eyes on you. And I pray, Lord, that you'll just help us, Lord, to, to live for you and be the people you'd have us to be. I ask, Lord, that you'll fill me with your spirit to preach your word this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. A missionary in North India told the Christmas story and read it from the scriptures. And someone asked him, how long has it been since God's son was, it came into the world? The missionary said, well, it was about 2,000 years. Well, then the villager asked, well, then who has been hiding this book all this time? Hiding the book. We saw last week that the devil wants this book to be hidden. He doesn't want it to be known. He doesn't want you and I to know what God has to say. Last week, we saw in our Bibles how when God sent his angel to deliver to Daniel this message, the devil sent his own angel to try to stop it. And uh, the message that was being sent was a message that the devil didn't want to get out. And I don't know about you, but when someone tells me that I can't know something, when I'm not allowed to see something, when I'm not allowed, if they're trying to keep a secret from me, just makes me all the more curious, doesn't it? <laughs> just makes you all the more want to know what is it? My wife's cooking something and she says, I don't want to tell you what I'm cooking. Well, you got to find out. <laughs> you you got to, it just makes you all the more interested in what is the secret? Well, if the devil doesn't want us to know, I really want to know what it is that the devil doesn't want us to know. And so this morning, we're going to see that. This passage, Daniel chapter 11 and 12, we're only looking at 11 this morning, but this is the big secret. This is what the devil wants to keep secret, that he doesn't want you and I to know. It's the scripture of truth. And there are things here that the devil wants to keep quiet. He doesn't want you to know these things. And this morning, the title of my message is, The Devil Doesn't Want You to Know. But it, I dare say, if it's important enough for God to send his angels to tell us, if the devil deems it dangerous enough to send his own angel to fight it, if God seems it so important that he sends Michael the archangel to make sure it gets there, then we better know it. <laughs> We are best to know what it is that God wants us to know. What doesn't the devil want you to know? Well, first of all, the devil doesn't want you to know the sovereignty of God. He doesn't want you to know that God is the one who is on the throne. Why does he send his angel to oppose the delivery of this prophecy? Because this prophecy declares the sovereignty of God. Look at verse number one of chapter 11. Also, I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And as we go through this whole chapter, this verse in this whole chapter is a declaration of the truth of Daniel 2.20, that it is God who raises up kings 
and setteth them down. That it is God who is the sovereign in the universe. The devil would like you to think it's him. After all, he is called the prince of the power of the air. He, he, he offered to our Savior the kingdoms of this world because, in a sense, they were his to give. And yet, as much power as he may yield in this world, as much influence as he may convey, it's still God who sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. It's still God who made all these things, and the nations are but a drop in the bucket. And while man might have looked at the situation and thought that it was Persia who in their strength had conquered the Babylonians, that it was Persia who in their strength had set up this great kingdom, and that Persia and their king Cyrus were the ones who had done all these great things. No, what had happened was God had pulled down the Babylonians and God had set up the Medes and the Persians. What had happened was an act of the sovereignty of God. Let's not forget that God is still the sovereign in this world. It's so easy to get discouraged when looking at the situation of this world. Regardless of what your personal opinions are, you can get overwhelmed. You can feel like this world's out of control and wonder, what's going on here? Where are we headed? Headed. But the soul that's fixed on God can rest knowing that God is sovereign and the kingdoms of men are in his hand. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He turneth it whithersoever he will. The devil doesn't want you to know that. The devil doesn't want you to know that God is the one who's over all. He wants to cover up that message and stop it from getting out. But God's sure to make sure it's recorded for us in Daniel chapter 11, the sovereignty of God. The devil doesn't want you to know that God is sovereign. Secondly, the devil doesn't want you to know the shortfall of men. The devil doesn't want you to know that man always comes short. As we make our way through Daniel chapter 11, we see kings in their glory. We see them rise and we see them fall. In this chapter, we have the, a history of the great A's of history. We have the history of Ahasuerus. We have the history of Alexander the Great, the history of Antiochus the Great, the history of Antiochus Epiphanes, and the history or the future history, history written in advance of Antichrist. We have the kings of men presented to us. And as you consider them, there's one similarity that stands out between all of them. And it's this. Their time is short. Their time is short. They have their reign. That They have their time in, their, in the sun. And then it's gone. Darius was the first king of Persia in chapter one. There's three more kings of Persia. Then there comes one that's richer than them all. That's Ahasuerus. That's the king in the days of Esther. That's the king who had that great banquet showing off his wealth, showing off his splendor, and who history tells us sent 2.64 million soldiers against Grisha, only to suffer defeat at the hands of Alexander the Great. He had it all. He was richer than them all, but he lost. He says in verse 2, his riches, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. Daniel prophesied that during the reign of Cyrus, the first king of Persia. And it says, and a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. The king of Grisha, Alexander the Great, stood up against Ahasuerus and defeated him. Alexander the Great rose up, perhaps the greatest general the world has ever known marched around the globe, conquered it so great, so quickly. He rules with great dominion, Daniel 11:3 3 says, doing according to his will. But when he stands up, his kingdom is broken. Verse 4, when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside him. And we see that's exactly how it happened to Alexander the Great. 
he dies in the midst of his strength. When he's only 33 years old, he passes away. Was it poison? Was it out being an, a drunk? Is that how he died? How did he die? No one really knows. But he died just like that. And his, his kingdom was plucked up, but not to his posterity, not to anybody from his family tree. In fact, he only had three potential heirs to the throne. He had an uncle who was mentally handicapped. He had a child that was born illegitimately to a, a woman that wasn't his wife. And he had a wife who was pregnant at the time of his death. They say that within 14 years after his death, all three of his potential heirs had been murdered. And so it continues as we go through this chapter. His, his generals take over and it, it's divided to the four corners of the globe, north, south, east, and west. And all through this chapter, we see different men come. They rise and they fall. They have their time in the sun, but it's short. They seem to have it all, but it's just for a moment. And then what happens to their wealth? What happens to their dominion? What was the point of it all? You see, the devil doesn't want you to know that. The devil wants you to look at these men and think, wow, if only I could be like them. The devil wants you to think that this world is where everything's at. They want you to think that this is this is what we live for. We live for power. We live for things. We live for splendor. No, we live for the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil wants you to have your focus on the things of this life. He wants you to think that man is impressive and that he can be in his, that he can get by in his days without God. But the reality is man's life is just a dash between two dates. Man's life is but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And then whose are those things that you hold dear? What was the point of living without God, without following him? The devil doesn't want you to know that. He doesn't want you to know the shortfall of men. He doesn't want you to know the sovereignty of God or the, or the shortfall of men. Number three, he doesn't want you to know the sureness of scripture. The sureness of scripture. The devil doesn't want you to know that the Bible is accurate in everything that it says. The devil doesn't want you to know that the Bible can be trusted, that you can build your life on it. The verses we already have looked at, they were accurate, weren't they? The kings of Persia, the conquest of Alexander the Great, the dividing of his kingdom into four parts. That's, that's impressive that that was accurately prophesied of before it ever happened. But if you thought that was impressive, you should consider the prophecies that have been fulfilled from verse 5 down to verse 35. All the way down through this chapter, we see prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Over 100 prophecies already that have been literally fulfilled to the, to, to the jot and tittle as Daniel prophesied in Daniel chapter 11. These prophecies are so accurate, so astonishingly accurate, that critics of the Bible say that they're too accurate for it to have been written during the time of Daniel. They say there's no way that someone could have written that hundreds of years before they actually happened. The person that wrote it had to have been alive after it happened. No. I mean, the Bible is on its own, stands by itself. But history even tells us how Daniel's book was present before these things started to happen. That the Jews had the book of Daniel and showed it to Alexander the Great before we even get to Daniel, to Daniel 11, verse 5. They already had this book. And the prophecies of Daniel, John Phillips writes, are recorded in such detail, and so many of them have been so meticulously fulfilled in history that unbelieving critics have, have resorted to suggesting a late date for the book. According to them, the book of Daniel was written after the prophecies recorded takes place. They, they would make the book a forgery, the author a fraud, and its divine inspiration of first. But what's at stake here is simple. It's whether or not God is omniscient. It's whether or not God is omniscient about the future. The issue at stake is whether or not God is able to foresee what will happen down the road. And if he is able, then the prophecy of the future can be as detailed as God wants to make it. 
He could have said exactly how many hairs you'd have on your head ahead of time. He could have told every single detail that he wants to tell because he is able to predict the future because he already knows the future. God doesn't dwell in time and space, but all things are open before his eyes. And we see in this text that he foresaw these events, the coming of the kingdoms of Grisha and all the different things that happened in the Hellenistic period of history long before they ever did. And to our God, it's a small thing to forecast to us future events. Just consider Daniel 11. Daniel 11 is one of the proof texts in the book of Bible, a proof text in the Bible that proves the accuracy of God's word, proves its credibility, proves the omniscience of God. And uh, we could spend a long time just going through the book of Daniel chapter 11 and going through history and just laying, comparing prophecy to history and seeing how it fits perfectly, how Daniel's prophesied exactly what happened. And I don't think we have enough time to do all of the details, but I'll do my best to give you a little bit this morning. You notice in this text that everything that Daniel says, that's how it happened. Uh, this text is, uh, in the text, the kingdoms divide into four parts. Uh, that's exactly how it happened. Only two kingdoms then are mentioned, the north and the south. Those are the two kingdoms, the, the one north of Israel and the one south of Israel. They became the two great kingdoms, and they had a chaotic power struggle. The north and the south, uh, uh, the north, a kingdom of Syria, the south kingdom of Egypt. These two kingdoms were the seats of power in the Hellenistic period. And the prophecy focuses on them because the prophecy is for the nation of Israel, the people of God. And where are Syria and Egypt? One's to the north of Israel, one's to the south of Israel. And what's right in the middle? God's people. And as these two kingdoms would fight for supremacy, as they fought and had their battles, the nation of Israel was right stuck dab in the middle. And that's why it says in verse number one of chapter, uh, chapter 10, that the prophecy that Daniel saw was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and the un understanding of the vision. And as a result of that, he's mourning three full weeks, eats no pleasant bread. Now he knows that it's bad. That's understood in verse number one, that what he saw was a long, painful time for the children of God, for the people of God, the nation of Israel. And so we see how all these things happened exactly as God said it would. Verse five begins with the rise of the Ptolemaic Empire. That's the empire of Egypt. It's founded by one of Alexander's generals. Uh, the text was that the king would be strong in one of his princes. Well, history tells us that another of Alexander's generals was made king of Babylon, king of the northern kingdom, and was forced to flee. And he came to, to so, so, Ptolemy Psalter, the king of Egypt, and was strengthened by him. Becomes stronger than Ptolemy, returns and recaptures his kingdom in nor the northern kingdom that includes Syria here. And he becomes stronger than the king of the south and has great dominion. That's in verse number five. The king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes. And he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And for a lot of years, there's a peace between the north and south. But at the end of the years, verse six says, in the end of the years, they shall join themselves together. For the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement but she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but he, she shall be given up and they that brought her and he that begat her and he that strengthened her in these times. Uh, verse six was amazingly fulfilled. After some years of peace, they start to have a long time of war, but in the end of the years, they join themselves together. And that's exactly what happened. The king of the south offered the king of the north a bribe for peace. He offered his daughter. Ber Berenice with a large dower on condition that the Syrian king should declare his former marriage to his wife Laodice void and her two sons illegitimate. That would make it to the son that they would have would be the future king of the north. But when Ptolemy Philadelphus died, his daughter Berenice could no longer retain the power of the arm for Antiochus Zeus put her away 
and took back his former wife, Laodice. But neither did he himself stand for Laodice, his former wife, didn't trust his motives and wanted to secure the crown for her own son and poisoned her own husband. And so opened the succession to Seleucus Callinicus. And then Laodice persuaded Seleucus to have Baroness assassinated and her child, who by the articles of her marriage had been made heir to the throne, he was also killed, as well as all those who strengthened her in those times of failed attempts there. That is Clarence Larkin's notes there. And that's exactly how it happened in verse number six. You go down through this whole chapter. And as the verse says, that's exactly how it happened. Verse seven to eight tells us that branch that would come out of her roots, meaning an offspring of Berenice's parents, and refers to her brother, Ptolemy Eurigetus, who succeeded his father as king. And history tells us that he was so upset about what happened to his sister that he came up to Syria to the fortress of the king of the north and defeated them and spoiled them in order to avenge his sister's death. And that's prophesied of in verses 7 and 8. Verse 9 and 10 is the revenge of the northern kingdom. Uh, the, the sons mentioned the sons of the kings of the north. They assemble their armies. They fight back. One of his sons, Antiochus, Antiochus the Great, overflows and passes through, marches against the fortress, which was in Gaza. And verse 11 and 12 tells us he doesn't win. The king of the south defends himself. But it says at the end of verse 12 that he's not strengthened by it. Verse 13 tells us how Antiochus will come back bigger and stronger. Verse 14 tells us he's not alone. Philip, the king of Macedon, comes with them. And in the meantime, in Israel, wicked, wicked Jews would be causing trouble for the devout ones, fulfilling the vision, uh, the vision of suffering of troublous times. But Antiochus the Great would turn against them. They'd fall. That's recorded in verse 15 and 16. Now, verse 17 is the story of Cleopatra. And I was all excited to tell you that it's the famous Cleopatra, thinking that it was the Cleopatra with the, end, the last pharaoh of Egypt. But it's a completely different Cleopatra, like the great uh, grandmother or something like that. I don't know. But uh, that's how well I know history. It said Cleopatra. I just assumed it was the famous one, but it's not. But uh, it says in verse 17, he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. This shall he do. He shall give him the daughter of woman, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. So what happened is Antiochus the Great, the king of Egypt, or the king of Syria, wants to conquer Egypt. Egypt at this time has a young pharaoh. The pharaoh is only about 12 years old. So he has an idea. He has a daughter that's about 12 years old. He says, let, let me give my daughter to the king of Egypt to marry, and he'll think that I'm working peace, and this is a, an act of peace, but really I just want my daughter to betray him and to help me win the war against him. So he gives his daughter, whose name is Cleopatra, to this young king of Egypt, only to have his daughter betray him, betray him and help her husband and win the war for the Egyptians. And that's the story of this first Cleopatra when it says, she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. And so Antiochus the Great so upset, he turns to fight against the armies, uh, the, the, the isles. He ultimately ends up losing to a prince, just as it's prophesied. They make him pay a great amount of taxes. And so after his death, his son comes up, or yeah, his son comes in and taxes the glory of the kingdom. And what he did when it says he taxes, and he raises taxes in the glory of the kingdom, literally he taxed the temple. He went to the temple of Jerusalem, took all this precious things out of it, and he used that to pay off the debt that his father had incurred from all of those wars. And it all happens exactly as Daniel prophesied. There's no arguing that these scriptures weren't exactly fulfilled. There's no denying it. That fact is the, the, they were fulfilled, and that's the reason critics can't stand this chapter. It's because you go down through these verses and they all happened exactly as God said they would. And people say, God can't give something so detailed. No one can know that. No, God does know it. And he gives us the history written in advance. And verses 21 to 34 tell us a king we've already, 21 to 35 tells us a king we've already seen. 
tells us of the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes, that vile person. It says in verse 21, in his state shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. That vile person is the Antichrist of the Old Testament. He's a type of him. He's Antiochus Epiphanes. And there are some actual overlaps in his reign of terror and the reign of terror of the coming Antichrist. But because he wasn't the rightful king, he, he had no business being the king. He actually, uh, he was the, a younger son of Antiochus the Great. His brother passes away. It's supposed to be his brother's son who's king, but that son's still young. And Antiochus Epiphanes is able to, with flatteries, take the kingdom. And he turns on those that gives him the kingdom. He does all these things to grade himself bigger and stronger as is prophesied in verses 21 to 26. And then he starts to turn against the nation of Israel. And, uh, and he starts to, uh, he disposes of the prince of the covenant. That's the high priest. Uh, we read how he rises. We read how he starts small, becomes great, comes against the kings of the south, wins a great battle. He can't conquer the king of the south. Verse 27, he makes a, he makes a covenant with the king of the south, but they're speaking lies at the same table. They both made a covenant. They both broke it. In verse 28, then he returns to his own land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. Uh, he, he literally, he, he heard that there was a false report among the Jews about his own demise that caused the Jews great joy. And the high priest was starting to take the, back the temple. And so he looted the nation of Israel on his way back from Egypt to Syria. In verse 29, it says, At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former and the latter. He starts coming against, the, against Egypt, but the Romans now oppose him. And he takes out his anger on the land of Israel. It's then that he sets up the abomination of desolation in the holy place. He sets up, the, he literally, Antiochus Epiphany set up an altar to Zeus in the temple of God. He literally offered a pig upon the altar in the temple. He defiled it. So polluted it so much the Jews couldn't go into the temple. And he fulfilled these scriptures exactly as they were written. These stories in history are the stories that people write books of, that they play out in movies. And God prophesied that these events would happen exactly as they happened long before they did. There's no arguing the sureness of scripture. That's why critics say it can't be supernatural because it's so accurate. But we know that it was written long before it happened and that God has no problem predicting the future. No wonder the devil sent his angel to stop us from getting it. No wonder the devil sent his angel to try to stop the message from getting out. These all things happened exactly as God said they would in Scripture. God foresaw it, wrote it down so that we could know the certainty of the words of truth. And if God's able to write these words in great detail accurately, don't you think he can tell us the way of salvation accurately? Don't you think that everything God says about the future of our world is accurate? The devil doesn't want you to know. He wants you to think that you can't trust the, the scriptures. But God's proven already that the scriptures are accurate. You have in this passage, the devil doesn't want you to know some things. Doesn't want you to know that God's sovereign. Doesn't want you to know the shortfall of men doesn't want you to know the shortness of scripture. And he doesn't want you to know the shipwreck of Satan. He doesn't want you to know that the devil's ship is a sinking ship. In this passage that closes with the prophecy of the Antichrist. A prophecy of the Antichrist. And, and listen, we could go into so much more detail of chapter 11. But I just think that, uh, well, it probably is already uh, hard to keep everyone's attention with such a detailed prophecy of the history of the nations. But in verse 36, down to the end of the chapter, it says that it's talking about the Antichrist. There's a break in this passage between the verse 35 and 36. 
Verse 35 speaks of even to the time of the end, because it's yet for a time appointed. You know, Antiochus Epiphanes had his time, but now this passage brings us to the time of the end. We're now entering the 70th week of Daniel, when the Antichrist sets up his kingdom, when he is the king, the, the, the little horn that, set, that's, that is the mightiest of the ten horns, the, the mightiest of the ten toes, the little horn that conquers the rest. And it says in verse number 36 about this king, he's the willful king. It says, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things about, against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of woman, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of horses, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with the strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And at that time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. This is the rise of Antichrist in these verses. This is the rise of Antichrist in the 70th week of Daniel. This is the prince of the people that shall come, the little horn, the fourth beast. In this text, he's referred to still as the king of the north. And we know he'll be the king of the revived Roman Empire. The north referring to the area that Antiochus Epiphany ruled which, by the way, includes Babylon, Babylon the Great. And you read in Revelation of the fall of Babylon. He is described in the text as the willful king. His plan isn't just to defeat the people of God. His plan is to dethrone God. His plan is to make himself God, have the people worship him as God. And that's described in verse 36. There's no God that he regards, not the God of his fathers. He's not Antiochus Epiphanes. The things he does, Antiochus Epiphanes never did. He's a, he, 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 he worshiped, Antiochus Epiphanes worshiped Zeus and, Zeus and set up an image of Zeus in the temple. But the Antichrist will set up an image of himself. He'll honor the God of forces. That's the devil. That's the beast. Uh, that's the dragon. The one who will give him the kingdoms of this world. He'll take the deal that our Savior refused and will bow down and worship the dragon. And so he'll make war with the other kings of the earth. He'll be the head of the kingdom of the ten toes, the revived Roman Empire, which is believed to include all the empires of the book of Daniel. Even the kings of the north and south, they are returned, and the king of the south comes against him. But they can't stop him. He enters into his country, overflows, passes over. He comes into the glorious land. That's Israel. In many countries are overthrown. Only a few are left out. Edom, Moab, and Ammon, the descendants of Esau and Lot. Not because there's no judgment for them, but God will deal with them himself. And God tells us this in advance. He, he'll confiscate the treasures of Egypt. Ethiopia and Libya will fall at his feet. But verse 30, 44 tells us, tidings over the east and over the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. So he hears tidings. He gets all furious, starts to destroy as many as he can. He goes to the holy mountain. That's Israel. That's Jerusalem. That's where the temple of God is. He'll plant his tabernacles of his palace right there in the glorious holy mountain. But it's there that he comes to his end. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. When Christ returns, that's how he'll come to his end. When Christ returns, 
that will consume him with the brightness of his coming. Christ will defeat him in just a moment. The devil doesn't want you to know that his own history, does he? The devil wants you to think that he's going to have his own way. The devil wants you to think that he's on the winning side. But as much as the Antichrist is allowed to do, ultimately we know how the story ends. He comes to his end and none shall help him. The devil doesn't want you to know that. He'd rather you think that he wins, that he ends up on top. But the scripture of truth that God delivers to us tells us of his fate. You know, it's only one more thing for us this morning. The devil doesn't want you to know the sovereignty of God, the shortfall of men, the shortness of scripture, or the scheme of Satan. And one last thing, he doesn't want you to know the security of God's people. There's a common thread all through here. God's people are protected. Yes, they have a difficult time. The thing was true. The time appointed was long. It, it was a it was a long, difficult time for the nation of Israel. And 530 years of persecution, followed by the time of Jacob's trouble. But through it all, God sees them through. And at the end, in chapter 12, verse 1, it tells us, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even in that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. <laughs> who's delivered? Everyone whose name is written in the book. Every single one of them is delivered. Every single one of them is seen through. They're secure and they enter into the kingdom of God and his Christ. What about those that perished already? What about those that passed away in the times of trouble? Are they there? Yes, we see that they'll rise again. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt, depending on the, whether or not their name was written in the Lamb's book of life. But those who know the Lord, they have the assurance that, they'll see, they'll, that God will see them through. They'll have the, they have the assurance that, yes, there will be trials in this world. Yes, the devil will have his time. Yes, there will be kings that come and go in different hard times that God's people will pass through. But through it all, God's people are delivered. Through it all, God's people are secure. They're secure because they're the children of God. Friend, I wonder, do you, do you know what it's like to be secure? Do you know the Lord is your Savior? It's so easy to look at the world and be distressed, be discouraged at all that you see. It's easy to be overwhelmed by problems, by the world's inability to deal with the hand that's been given to them. But Christian, you're secure because you're a child of God. There was a lady by the name of Lina Sand Sandelberg, who was a young lady that had great trials. She was paralyzed as a young child, wasn't able to accompany her family to church or anywhere really, but the Lord cared for her and miraculously helped her get better from her paralysis and she was still had great sorrows in her life she was at sea traveling with her father only to have her father fall overboard and drown she got married then endured the loss of her firstborn son and you think that someone that had such trials would be bitter against God that they would question the security of the believer but she knew it and she wrote many hymns and praise to God and one of the ones she wrote goes like this more secure is no one ever than the loved ones of the Savior. Not yon star in high abiding, nor the birds in home nest hiding. God his own doth tend and nourish, in his holy courts they flourish. Like a father kind he spares them, in his loving arms he bears them. Neither life nor death can ever from the Lord his children sever. For his love and deep compassion comforts them in tribulation. Little flock to joy then yield thee. Jacob's God will ever shield thee. Rest secure with this defender. At his will, all foes surrender. And God's children are secure. The devil would have you think that you're not. He'd have you worry and fret. As you read chapter 11 of Daniel and read of the difficult times that this world has faced and that God's people have seen, you think, how in the world will we make it through this mess? With God's help. 
God, our help in ages past is still our hope for years to come. We can still trust him for the future. He'll keep his children safe. He'll see them through. The devil doesn't want you to know. He doesn't want you to know the sovereignty of God. He doesn't want you to know that man falls short. He doesn't want you to know that the scripture is short. He doesn't want you to know that his, his ship is shipwrecked. He doesn't want you to know that God's people are secure. But God's given it to us. He's revealed it all to us through his word. And these truths are for us and for our children. I wonder, do you know them? You know these truths that the devil would love to keep from you. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for the time we've had in your word this morning. Lord, it's a challenging passage of scripture, but Lord, it's so encouraging to think of how you wrote this all in advance, and it all happened exactly as you said it would. And when we think of the future and the coming reign of Antichrist, and Lord, we're thankful that the future is going to happen just as you said it would, and that the rapture is going to happen. You've not appointed us to wrath, and that we're secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you'll bless our time together, and I pray that you'll bless these truths to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.